Hi, everyone. My name is Alex Arrakis. I'm here with Ken Lassison. We're going to be having a great live lecture on the microbiome and some of the tools that Ken has developed. Um, so it's a really exciting lecture. I'm going to give a brief introduction about Ken. Uh, so Ken has a master's in science, operations research, and statistics, and has worked in information sciences, employee of familiar names such as Starbucks, Microsoft, Verizon, Blackboard, a lot of uh, startups. Um, he's taught at both in math and science at the high school and college level and computer, computer science at many different universities. So he has a, a large programming background. Uh, he started programming on one of the first computers in 1968, which had uh, 240 bytes of RAM, 120 uh, machine instructions, the same computer used for Apollo 11. Mm -hmm. and it's kept abreast of all of the latest programming languages. Um, High-functioning ASP person who's had to deal with some microbiome issues, my, lo my logic encephalomyelitis, and chronic fatigue syndrome. And that is kind of the impetus of what led him into the microbiome and doing some more research to kind of help his, his condition. Um, Ken states that he makes some bad puns. Uh, he has three corgis, and it's natural that he steps in poop. Um, so I want to thank Ken for being with us. I'm very excited to have him speak about his work and uh, have him share. Uh, just briefly, I wanted to mention that uh, uh, ARC is uh, partnered with uh, the Brain Foundation, so you can make um, tax-deductible donations. Please, um, it goes to a good cause, and it uh, helps drive uh, a lot of the very important research. So, Ken, great to have you. Awesome to hear you share your your tools and your experience and your insight. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Let me give you a little bit more of background. Um, I'm a survivor of being autism spectrum disorder from 60 years ago. 60 years ago, few people, I mean, few MDs even knew what autism was, um, which of course had some interesting challenges. I was a survivor, I survived, fortunately high functioning, uh, and so you learn to adapt and understand what I work well with, what I didn't work well with. And later on, in retrospective, uh, suddenly became quite apparent what I was dealing with is now called autism. Um, and not unexpected, um, parents were both in the mid forties when I was born and didn't start the process of learning to speak until I was eight years old. Again, very characteristic of autistic children. Fortunately, high functioning, which meant I learned and adapted. And as typical for many people with autism, I ended up going into sciences and mathematics. Um, it was simply the natural thing to go into, especially because of the speech problem, not being interested or, n or not realizing that any occupation involving speech was going to be problematic. So ended up going towards the academic bent, particularly mathematics, um, and was very successful there in high school um, and university, um, top in the country in some math competitions. Okay, so a couple of, of caveats. First of all, I'm not a medical professional. I don't do cons do consultations. However, um, I will do when when asked to do blog post, public blog post on a particular sample and give my reading of it as suggestions to be discussed with your medical professional. Again, I'm not licensed to dispense um, advice, etc. and I prefer to say clear of the practice pra appearing to practice medicine scenario. So by making everything educational post, I largely avoid that whole issue. Um, there are many areas where people, when you deal with the microbiome, are interested in things like leaky gut and GI mortality. Those things I'm aware of, but I don't have any great expertise. I'm very much autistic, like focus on the microbiome and build the site using that and using the fact that the autistic aspect allowed me to be hyper-focused as well as hyper-concentrate on a topic. So basically autism helped me make me who I am by my learning how to adapt to its characteristics. And I was successful doing so. Um, 
What I'm going to do is talk about methods. There is no right definitive answer. In fact, that's one of the problems. There, there is no thing. You look for, okay, what should I do? My answer is, well, you go about just a path, tap path, tap path, tap path, tap path. I can tell you which one I have a site preference for. And more importantly, I tried building my site to allow anybody to walk down any one of the paths they want to be, want to follow up on so that the information is there. They can reuse it as they choose. Okay, let's go on. And first thing dealing with autism is don't homogenize autism. And that is a bit of a nightmare because it makes things more complicated. Um, we are not dealing with one condition. We are dealing with many different ones. And all of these conditions are dropped into what I call waste paper basket called autism because it's nice and easy for MDs to refer to just cluster things as one. The differences in autism can be ascribed to some common factors, DNA or SNPs mutations, historical events like birth weight, mother's use of sediment thing, etc., mother's age, could also be due to some micro biome disturbances and to environment. Um, we know that lead in the air or other pollutants has environment and increases the risk of autism. So causes are many, but looking at all the possible causes on how to deal with them, the one that ends up being the easiest to address, especially since you often don't need an MD involvement, is microbiome disturbances. Many other items are what I term water under the bridge. It has happened, it's the past, going back and visiting what it is doesn't help you deal with the immediate issue, which is how to make life better for your child with autism. Um, Bottom them right is a recent study from this year. Um, and the fact that it's heterogeneous population. So the result is what works for Charlie doesn't work for Dave. What works for Mary doesn't work for Violet. It's heterogeneous, which again puts more learning on your plate to work with. Now, what where I got into the microbiome was because of MECFS. Um, and in some ways, we have similarity. A lot of the causalities for MECFS and that of autism are similar. Not only are they similar, but often they portray similar um, symptoms. Example is brain fog, inability to concentrate, um, poor executive decisions, etc., and sometimes headaches and other characteristics. Um, sometimes they're environmental for MECFS, often Epstein Barr, Q fever, Lyme are associated environmental influences, which may have caused the MECFS. It may have been the cause, but removing the cause may not cause a change because often the cause has already been removed. It's the consequences that it is there. With, with autism, we have a vast variety of symptoms which are different from patient to patient. Exactly the same situation with MECFS. The full listing of MECFS symptoms is about 125 different symptoms in the literature. Autism has a great number of symptoms too. A lot of them are similar. And what is interesting or what is sweet or nice is that many symptoms appear to be strongly associated to the microbiome. Uh, and in fact, um, there's some interesting studies about it is that um, they actually, recent study out of China found that for COVID symptoms, there was a direct association with the microbiome. If they had a certain microbiome before they get COVID, they would develop certain symptoms, which is sort of interesting, but also it's illuminating because the microbiome determines the immune system, the immune system response determines some symptoms. Now, one thing I want to emphasize, because I've seen it with MECFS people and suspect some autism people, parents also have it, is things are water under the bridge. 
frequently people become focused on the causes, the past, and not the treatment of the future. The root cause may no longer be there. It's actually irrelevant for improving a child's life. What we want to do is going forward. And it's just sort of, it's something which you don't dwell on the past. Growing up with autism, I never dwell on the past because it was just going to lead me down a literally depressing road. Okay, one thing is um, there's something which I've seen often called wrong diagnosis, but the right treatment dilemma. Example is some autism fans are expected to be caused by Lyme. They go in and they get tested for Lyme. Unfortunately, almost all tests for Lyme are unreliable, mainly because they're cross-reactive to other viruses. For example, Epstein-Barr is a common virus they would be cross-reactive to. And the result of them getting a positive Lyme test is they're treated with antibiotics, um, minocycline, doxycycline, amoxicillin, et cetera, and the child improved. The conclusion is that Lyme was a cause. No, it may, it could be the cause, but it's actually more likely to be some other things. One is antibiotics are known to be anti-inflammatory or suppress brain inflammation. You simply may have be treating inflammation and that is the cause of the improvement and Lyme had nothing to do with it. Antibiotics also known to modify the microbiome, which are associated with a variety of neurological conditions very strongly in recent literature. So you may actually be modifying the microbiome. Diagnosis was Lyme, rationale gave, gave antibiotics, things improved, and it's nice. And actually right now in today's medical world, getting antibiotics is often a challenge. You have to prove evidence for needing them almost in order to get supervisors to sign up on them or to survive medical reviews, which means, okay, wrong diagnosis, right treatment. Don't argue the point, just see if it works. And if it works, fine, be happy. Um, generally when I see the word chronic, just as a personal thing with me, I usually, it causes a bit of a red flag that the diagnosis may be incomplete or wrong. It's sort of an easy cop-out, in my opinion, for many people, um, many physicians treating people. Okay, let's take a look at what the micro, let's get into what the purpose of my talk is, rather than my wandering halfway around the universe on other issues, is the microbiome factor. We have, and you'll find this on the site, we, what we will find is that there's a whole ton of different diseases and conditions. Autism is one of them. Uh, allergies, Alzheimer's, anorexia, nervosa, um, a whole bunch of things have distinctive microbiome shifts reported in the literature. That is, they did a study and they found, wait a minute, this particular group of people have too much of this and too little of this. And it's, it's a statistically significant pattern often uh, significant as one in, in 100,000 of being the odds of it's not being there. So what we have is a microbiome associated with conditions. At a high level, a disease or infection may, to borrow a word from sci-fi, terraform the microbiome. It will send out signals to the microbiome to produce what it needs and to stop producing what it doesn't need. So the result is it alters a microbiome, which often occurs, often happens after a infection is technically gone, not detectable, symptoms still persist for a while and then fade away. And the reason they persist is that the microbiome is still following the old instructions it's received and hasn't reset itself. So the microbiome factor is something to keep in mind. DNA also favors, um, how the microbiome forms. DNA has interaction there. It's been found that certain DNA combination impacts whether or not certain bacteria take out. So we have a mixed case. So what I'll, my basic goal is very simple. We want to sabotage the dysfunction at the microbiome level. We want to undo what it did and we want to do it as fast as we can 
but with the least amount of risk. Um, so down the bottom is some citations about genetics and the microbiome. For those who are wondering, yes, it is a factor in there. The microbiome is full of factors that, that potentially complicate trying to do a simple solution. Here is, um, we have studies on autism and they are growing. And I'm just going to uh, swing over and bring across a page. So if you go to my site, you click log on. And if you go here and use the bottom site example login. And the reason I went there is because it puts you up into a high privilege to access information and what we want to do is um go over to microbiome reports and there's a page so if you go down here to autism you'll find here is the literature the book stack being the literature on it here is if you have your own sample um how you you compare your sample to what is in the literature the actual bacteria which are being reported candidates for what may correct the microbiome test ranking if you're looking at what tests to do distribution which is indicating how far or close you are to the definitions from the literature but i'll come back to all of that later if we click autism here we have you will, if you do this quick login, you'll find you get all 37 articles listed there. And you will find that you get a full text either here or for this one, you will get, um, for example, ketogenic diet, you click here. Fingers crossed. Ta -da. And now you get a full text of the study. So it hopefully will speed up your getting up to speed because now you can get not just a summary, you can get a full text and read through the full text very quickly. Okay, let's get back to the presentation. Um, so we have the studies there. Generally, once a month, I go through the latest publications from PubMed and updated. So this list will keep growing as new studies are released. Um, one of the things to be aware of, and that is the studies will indicate things, something, and then the next study will say the exact opposite, which tends to be frustrating. Um, often they are consistent, three different studies, all saying low, three studies, all two saying high, and one saying low. And the gotcha is there is no universal shift shift there diet and dna will cause variation so the one person may go high another person may go low and that comes back to the bottom line is that testing is needed to be able to know what path to walk through the microbiome you cannot just say oh okay this is what somebody with autism has therefore i will do it no different subgroups in autism have different shifts and you need to find out what your child shift is to be able to correctly deal with it. And the shift tends to drive diet and supplement changes. Um, okay, now I come to the next area, which is alternative treatment. Uh, or how do we find out how to treat it? First, let's describe how conventional medicine science does, which is correct. But if you have a child with autism, you really want things to improve before he starts collecting old age pension. So some classically, someone proposes, they go off and do a clinical study, overall results reported, and it's slowly disseminated out of physician. And by slowly, I mean slowly. My best example, I know of is in 1954. There was ev evidence that ulcer was caused by each part by could be treated with antibiotics successfully. But it wasn't until the mid 90s, 45 years later, that the CDC started doing aggressive advertising program 
to inform physicians that polyps could be treated with antibiotics. Just took 45 years. Um, generally, the best time we can look at from a concept to clinical use is five plus years. If we are dealing with standard of practice, it's not five years, it's usually 15 to 20 years. So classic moves slowly, unfortunately. And usually the studies in it are dealing with overall. Non-responders or, or adverse responses are usually not mentioned in studies or just mentioned in passing. And more importantly, often they involve prescription drugs only because big pharma is doing the funding. So that is the classic pattern. That is what MDs were trained in university to accept as how we should go about it. Microbiome approach does a end run. Um, the, or, as you know, autistic people tend not to be that sensitive to social pressure, which is something which I definitely have. I tend to be... Um, creative, independent, and not prone to be sub being swayed by social pressures very much at all. The microbiome approach, basically it, it's simple. You get a microbiome result. You identify what the outliers are. You look out how to modify the outliers, and then you implement non-prescription modifiers of your own choosing. Um, it's fast, four weeks processing time from taking a sample to get results back. And then you can go and start trying it and seeing if it works or doesn't work for your child. Nice, simple. Even simpler or better is you are dealing, dealing using things which are in general non-prescription, generally recognized as safe, and or probably very, very safe in some cases. Um, and it's there. In few cases, you may get MDs who are willing to try some off-label prescription drugs the database I have includes prescription drugs. So you can actually get suggestions for, for possible things to discuss there. And um, hopefully some of this may lead to clinical studies, but again, clinical studies are a slow process, unfortunately. Main aspect of the approach I'm advocating to be considered is very low risk, and has a significant risk of having significant positive impact. In other words, it's a good deal. Let's take a look at how a microbiome sample is done because there's some gotchas in interpreting things. You get your stool, whichever type of stool you have. Uh, this comes from the Bristol stool types. Uh, you may want to look it up and keep track of your child's stools um, if they don't insist on privacy in the toilet. A little sample is taken, put in a test tube, is sent off, is put through a machine which does P PCR amplification. It produces a data file, which is often called a FASTQ file, which is like a DNA file. It's just a whole bunch of letters, um, four letters in different sequences going on for miles and miles, um, usually anywhere from eight to 25 megabytes of file. So it's a big file. It's now processed through software. Here we have software company number one, software company number two. Both of them may get the identical same data file. They will interpret, they do pattern matching to the RNA and you get two different parts. And lo and behold, report one has certain bacteria, report two doesn't have it. Report two has one and report one doesn't have it. So you immediately throw up your hands and say, wait a minute, which one is right? And Unfortunately, both are right or both are wrong, depending on there. If you, the reports are fuzzy, if you want to get some background of it, it's very simple. Just come from the National Institute of Science and Technology, the official government thing. Guess what? 2019, same data, same past data file processed could produce 97 different reports, different reports. And that's because there's no standardization. Everybody's trying to use this different partial information to get their results. And the result is you get no definitive report. You get a good report, 
you get it accurate for the data it was using, but reports are not compatible from one provider to another because they use different software. So let's go on. When we go and look at the report, a couple of things you bear in mind. If they give you ranges of standards, take it with a big, big grain of salt. If so much salt, you may become hypertensive from having too much salt. Generally, the ranges are based on adults, not kids. And that is a dilemma with, um, with looking at uh, children with autism because normal, what is normal is come even harder to discern. Um, and here at the bottom left, I have um, a chart from one, uh, one study and you can see the person's upper age and you can see how a particular bacteria, the numbers shift to grow up for age. From one to 10, there's a fair amount of dramatic change. From 10 to 20, it slows down. Once you hit about 20 to about 60 or 70, it's very stable. So there is a age factor coming into it. So you really should be asking for age-specific reference ranges. Unfortunately, I know no one who provides that information, although I understand biome site is considering trying, trying to get that type of information. Childhood diet also impacts this. Again, China is excel, excelling at doing a microbiome study. I mean, they're excelling because they have the technology, they have the cheap costs, and they're able with their variety of medical systems and persuasion to get large sample populations being done, which makes it a much easier to get good basis information. Here we have down here on the bottom right, we have have microbiome for kids from three to 36 months, so young kids. And we have the patterns according to which bacteria they have in different cities. In other words, a generic Chinese diet, but depending on the city they are in and the local variations in diet, you notice there's a fair amount of difference of what is or isn't in there in terms of very high or very um, top of the hierarchical structure of bacteria. So it, if you're looking for definitive answers, it's frustrating. Okay, so let's go step by step. I should say it's frustrating but it's not unsolvable. It's just that you have to do um, a technique called fuzzy logic, which means you are not getting definitive answer. You're just getting highly probable answers. Okay, the following are suggested steps. You get a 16S microbiome site, which should be a machine readable format. There are a lot of providers out there. Uh, and a lot of them, well, they don't provide a lot of useful information. They look nice, but you really cannot act on them very well. Thrive Inside is what I use currently, mainly mainly because they're cheap and easy to get hold of in the US. Biome Site, I also make use of. Uh, I've shipped my FASTQ files from Thrive Insight over to Biome Site, who I actually prefer their website much nicer. Plus, the staff there are much more aggressive in trying to improve um, microbiome reports, um, whereas Frag Inside is, tends to be a black hole. I send emails after them, nothing ever comes back. Um, and if you're interested in specific back in a specific bacteria, I have this link. We'll go and show which bacteria which test reports on. Again, remember different tests we report on different bacteria. If you're interested in a particular bacteria, I will tell you that's a test I'm looking at buying or using half to specific bacteria makes life easier. So once you have your 16S report or 16R, 16S RNA microbiome variety of way, most of the people I deal with just refer to as 16S, we identify the outliers, things which are abnormally high or abnormally low. 
Then the next thing is we look at what, mo what modifies this particular bacteria based on studies from the U.S. National Library of Medicine. So in other words, it's not, it's come from the internet, but it's not, it comes from, from published medical studies on the internet, which being read and data being extracted, some items will increase variety of bacteria and other will decrease. So we look up and say, okay, what increases, what decreases? How do I improve the dysfunction? As in bring the low ones up to the middle or the high ones down to the middle. It helps determine which subsets are acceptable. Um, some of the suggestions may not be acceptable to you. For example, if you are um, East Indian, the suggestion of eating raw beef may be very unacceptable to you. It may be a valid suggestion based on studies, but it may not be personally accepted, et cetera. So, so the purpose is to give a large, to give all the available suggestions for better or for worse. And you can just pick what you are comfortable with doing, figure out what you're going to do, try it, usually just for Four, at least four weeks of trying it, and then go back and do another test sample. It's not a test cures you all. It's an iterative step. Um, the first step will alter your microbiome. You get a new microbiome, which will be a, have a, dis, a, diff, a different degree of dysfunction, and they only have to go to the next one, and the next one, and the next one. So it's an iterative step. Uh, work um, I've used it successfully for myself for um, some relapses okay let's talk about a 16s report um, you basically want a report that has significant details and the report should give a percentage down to the species level of bacteria and the report should be uploadable on um, CSV or TSV. TSV is what uh, Nirvana makes use of. And the preferences, my preferences are there. Over here, you can see why I have the preference here. This is from people who have already uploaded. You can see how many bacteria is typically reported, what's the highest number I've gotten in any one sample, and what's the lowest number. The Xenogen, which is a Spanish firm, beats everybody else. Also, it's much more expensive. It's something like, I think, $800 a test, whereas uh, Biomsight and, and Thrive Insight are $50 to $100 range. So um, you get more information, you get more detail. Unfortunately, the additional detail you have doesn't buy you very much traction because you will get a whole bunch of bacteria name, and if you try searching for information on these new strains, you may be lucky to find two articles on PubMed about them and nothing which is useful for treating it. So Thrive Live and Thrive, sorry, Thrive Inside and Biomicide are generally the best trade up for usable information. Okay. We want to identify outlier where things have gone wrong. And here we end up, <sighs> I don't mean to be tossing manure at some of these um, business, but often we have providers using per forma logic. Number one is most labs will use a automatically do a bell curve distribution, calculate two standard deviations, and that now becomes their normal abnormal. Works well for majority of lab tests, does not work well for the microbiome. In fact, it does a horrible time. The ideal thing is you get actual percentile. Are you in the top 5% or the bottom 5%? Percentile means very simple. You take all the values, you line them up in order, and all you, if there's 100 values, bottom 5% means you want the lowest five values, top 5% means you want the top five values. So the percentile is actually folding anything else I've seen. Um, row count, nah, 
World count actually can lead you into the wrong path after three years of fighting the numbers. It's the wrong path. Um, percentile alone may not indicate it's abnormal. You can get high, but still be in the range of a normal population. And keyword, there ain't anything as a normal microbiome. There is nothing. It's elusive. It's a, it's like saying, oh, what's the average American? Uh, okay, what color? What is the skin color? How much is the urine, etc. If you really go down to the definition of average American, they perhaps have 1.7 kids. So find me somebody with 1.7 kids. Doesn't work. Okay, here's some real data. Here is a class of data, and here is the percentile ranking, and here is the number. And you notice that the curve is no bell curve. That doesn't look like a bell at all. And a bell curve has a characteristic which any statistics will tell you. If there's a normal distribution of bell curve, the mode, the most common value would be just about in the middle, the medium, the 50% will be in the middle, and the average would be in the middle. So all three of them would be right about the same spot on the bell curve. So if you look at how the bell curve goes, the Mold most common is where the, the peak of the bell curve. The medium, which is halfway up, again, it's in the middle. And the average generally would be pretty close to there. Well, where do we find? We have the mold, the most common value, being way, way down here. We have the average being up here. And somewhere in here, we, oh, at 50th percentile is where the median is. They should all be almost the same point. They're not. They're scattered from, from one end of the graph to the other. It's not a bell curve. You cannot use a normal distribution. You cannot take an average and standard deviation. Totally wrong. Believe me, as a statistician, that is absolutely the worst way to interpret the numbers. What I found, checking with some data science friend, is there's a process called the Kaltoff Maltrap algorithm. Uh, it's proprietary, but I got permission to make use of it. And we can show you very quickly on a chart what it is. What we do is we take the values here and we go and compute the logarithms of them. And then when you compute the logarithm of it, you get a bizarre thing showing up. You get almost a straight line. And then the bottom and the top, you get things change. And what the Kaltoff mall drop does, it, it goes and determines when this beautifully straight line, which we really don't know why it's a straight line, but it's a beautifully straight line when it ceases being straight line at one end or ceases being straight line at the other end. And at that point in time, looking at the data and, and only looking at the data with no other context, you can say, okay, something is abnormally happening there. So the pattern was strong and persistent. Some cases, it would be absolutely straight line to the very top. Other cases, straight line to the very bottom. So only one side is odd. That's fine. But it is a, once I discovered and looked at numbers, I, my light went on and said, okay, guess what? That is exactly something that makes sense. Um, dealing with all the variations of diet, of DNA, and everything out, when you have somebody getting off the straight line when you take a log of the values against percentiles, then something is definitely odd happening. So my site does a mechanical computation of it. Um, and we go down and most of the pages with bacteria, it will give you lower boundary and upper boundary. And now I would go and list, if I have obtained from any other sources, what other people deem to be low or high. So it's there for reference. And as you can see here, my high boundary is higher than anybody else's, but not particularly out too far out of sight. Low value is well between some of the average. So it's there. So it is a interesting, clever way by which we can detect abnormalities when we've got a very heterogeneous, very ugly mixed data with a whole bunch of different factors, age, um, diet, other medical conditions, all into trying. And it seems to produce very reliable results. Okay. Um, 
a few sites, for example, Nirvana or Cosmo does re report percentiles. And oh, that should should be there. The percentile um, gives the relative abundance and then the percentile here, which is effectively what I did. The problem is we don't know if the percentile is before this corner happens or not. Uh, it gives us better. You can assume something like 95 percentile up or 5 percentile down is probably a matter of concern, but it's nicer to have more compelling data. A couple of things I should point out is there's a nice range here, 25 to 67.5. Inter quartile range. In other words, you take all the numbers invited in the fourth group, a quantile. And it means that we're looking at 25 percentile to 70 five percentile. That's the middle 50 percent. Okay, so are you in range or not? Oh, um, you're not. Okay, person's not in range. But one catch is if you go down here, how, and you have 10 items here. How many do you expect to be out of the range? I'll tell you, five. Because 50% are expected to be out of range, which means you get a lot of what probably are very false positives of things you should correct. In other words, you're going to be busy chasing things that you have no need to be chasing, and chances are you're going to be ignoring what you should be ch chasing. So I wanted to give an explanation of it so that IQR interquantile ranges, and most of the ranges are a range, but you need to be a statistician to interpret it. And most of the time, if you're going to a statistician, you say, okay, that's nice. That doesn't tell me anything that's usable. It doesn't tell me if there's actually a problem. It just gives me numbers. And of course, showing numbers on page makes the um, many customers happier, which means the vendor is happier. Okay, so here's a presentation. Here's the interquantile range on the chart we looked at earlier. And you can see it from here to here, it's the middle 50%. And values down here, I don't see a problem with those values. Values up here, I don't see the line. Where the problem starts is around 97 percentile, and the bottom is about the 3 percentile. The The basic problem I see is that the range should fit the data and do not pretend the data matches a model. The latter is often what is done because a model, oh, I know what to do. When you don't have a, have a model to apply, you have to be more creative. You have to do more thinking. You have to do more analysis. And often that type of skill is sparse. Okay. On the site, you can determine how you choose things. Personally, I prefer the count of wall drop ranges. Um, it keeps focus on things that are problematic. However, you do have a choice. You can say, okay, give me the top three or bottom three percent, top six or bottom six, nine, 12, 15. And so you can go and say, okay, what is your criteria? You can don't have to go with the count of wall drop, which is my preference. You can go with anything on top or bottom three percent etc okay we also have more information coming out i went over to okay the killed encyclopedia of gene and genomics and they give me all sorts of information about each strain what bacteria what it produces in terms of enzymes and chemicals and I have managed to merge the data. So from the bacteria, which is being reported, I can calculate a variety of things such as which enzymes are being produced. And then I can go and do, as I did before, calculate percentiles compared to other people and count off ranges. Is this an abnormal or abnormal amount of this particular enzyme or not compared to everybody else? Again, using the same methodology, and it allows you a different way of approaching it. And the reason the enzyme analysis is important is that often the same enzymes are being used by 10 or 15 different bacteria. 
by themselves, everybody is called fine, but all of them are producing at 90%, 90%, 90%, 90%, 90%. When you add them all up, the total amount this enzyme being produced is up, is off the scale. You can never detect that by the 99 because you assume that each one, each one is a standalone component, but they're not. Each item produces enzymes, and those enzymes can push you through the roof. So where we have the information available, it's there. It's computed for you. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, let's continue onwards. Um, my site, basically what I do once a month, I sit down and spend a fair number of hours, I won't say how many, um, to encode information from PubMed studies. And data is what modifies it to which bacteria. For example, here we have um, probably barley is the item being described. And here are studies dealing with barley and how it impacts the microbiome. And remember, every modifier impact is mixed. Some increases, some decreases. So we end up having to do a balance. All my data is open source. I you don't trust me. In fact, I tell you, don't trust me. I have the information there. I have the source of my information. Go and read it. If you find a mistake, tell me. I'll correct it. I'm glad to be corrected. This has been a one-man effort with a lot of tired eyeballs and a lot of mental exhaustion on occasion. So I expect some mistakes to be made. I suspect my accuracy is probably at least 95 to 98% accurate. And there's a few tricks which are I've done to try reducing the risk of, of bad, bad data having a major influence. So modifiers are all coming from PubMed, uh, no folk tales or whatever, no personal experiences or whatever. Now, one of the things from on the Facebook group group that came up is um, that one aspect of the microbiome is you may be able to predict if something that's suggested will help or not help. If you have a recent sample, and if you accept the premise that some symptoms are caused by this biosis of the microbiome, and you have a drug or a substance, for example, um, cucumbers or blueberries, etc., you may be able to look up and see whether or not it will be a positive or negative impact on a display biases as a whole. If it's a negative impact, you may want to think twice about taking it and perhaps even look for alternatives in the same class of, act of items. If it improves it, you're happy. So it gives you a way to model whether or not it's going to be a good or bad reaction before taking it. doesn't guarantee it's going to be a correct forecast, but I believe it's probably has a reasonably high success rate, probably 75% or more. I've not tested it, um, not in a situation to test easily. So um, we can model what the impact is, which is nice using the site, very nice because it takes away some speculation or at least reduces speculation. It is a very individual result is something like with DNA testing you determine if you respond to some drugs some DNA are sensitive to certain drugs the microbiome is also susceptible to certain drugs so it's the same type of thing there is interplay happening here and we have a reasonable chance of predicting if this could be a good or bad interplay <sighs> suggestions are based on the proprietary algorithm to balance the positive and negative impact um, there's 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 one portion of it which I do give probiotics, which has no, which have positive impact with no negative impact, which is often a small list. But most of the time, it's a trade off uh, between four or five items. You've got 25 bacteria you're trying to modify, and you've got a substance that impacts 10 of them, and it is a juggling act. So, Coming from operations research, this type of optimization problem is familiar, and I've implemented an algorithm to try balancing it, and the algorithm has evolved over the last couple of years. There are dozens of reasonable algorithms. In fact, one uh, microbiome provider 
is looking at possibly implementing their own, but using the data for my databases, which is fine. Uh, I'm quite willing to uh, make available that data because my main goal is not to make money. I don't make money. Uh, in fact, it's, it was a for poverty website um, for many years. Um, but to help people, particularly my first one concerned with chronic fatigue, F, F, uh, CFS. Second one was autism, uh, both of which comes from personal experience. Um, but if you look at how you try figuring out the algorithm, is how do you figure, give the weight for what you're trying to adjust? Do you do it from how far away from the medium, the mode, the average for about 100 criteria? Four choices right there, and there's more choices. And do you attempt to shift it based on the, on the actual count of the bacteria? So the bigger the number of, number of bacteria, the more you weigh the other weighting mechanism. You end up literally sketching out on paper. You end up with dozens and dozens of possible algorithms you, you can use. And of course, people are free to make use of whatever algorithms they want. Um, I put my algorithms in there, and it's one which I've been pretty happy with the prediction ability. Occasionally, I will go back and try improving it, uh, but at the moment, the results are very acceptable. Key thing to remember is the base information is incomplete and occasionally study environment sensitive. Information could be dealing with shift seeing with people with diabetes in Mexico who are taking taking um, drugs for diabetics. So you have an ethnic population, you may have an age group population, so all the shifts come from there. In a few cases, I must admit, they come from animal studies. In fact, I frequently find that for some of the rare bacteria, vet studies actually are my biggest source of information. Whether or not it applies to humans is a question, but it is the best information we can locate. And where we don't have the perfect answer, I'm going to go with the, the best available answer. Often we have contradictory information. Again, fuzzy logic is used to try to resolve that. And I've also added a link to effective dosages. And the main reason is, or at least in dealing with people with the MECFS thing, is often people <coughs> end up, excuse my expression, um, homopathic dosages are not desired. For example, somebody says, oh, but I should have a vitamin D deficiency and taking a multivitamin. You know, you look at the um, multivitamin and you find that it has 50% of the daily RDA recommended. And if the person is my vitamin D deficient, that is not sufficient. So what I've done is I also have um, the dosages which were used in actual PubMed studies and clinical trials. Dosages which, which more importantly, one is somebody has investigated to find out what is probably a safe dosage. And two, if the study showed a positive result, it's effective starting. We don't know if it will be effective for you, but we know that for some conditions, it did cause enough of a change to have a positive result. In other words, okay, one dosage, if I have the dosage there, go with it. If I don't have the dosage there, email me, and I'll see what I can dig up and add it to the list of items with dosages. Because the whole key thing is too often people take too small dosages and say, why doesn't it work? Or it doesn't work. Bad mouthing, something that does work. And the reason often, unfortunately, is no one educates them on a dosage. What's on the bottle is not effective dosage always. Okay, suggestions are presented as avoid and take lists. Um, sometimes when you look at the avoid list, you suddenly realize, wait a minute, I've been taking those things. Oops, I shouldn't be taking those things. And you end up needing to modify your diet to degree, which is practical. The goal is to get better than random suggestions of the internet or wild speculation. It uses more information than most natural paths of MDs can keep in mind. It uses over a million individual facts to do it. And right now we have just hit 2,000 different samples, so we have a good sample population. 
to develop curves from. So it's good. We tend to rank things by confidence and not by magnitude of impact. Confidence is the key. We don't know everything is fuzzy. So the best thing we can do is this is the most likely based on more studies saying it does cause this type of shift than something else. Most of the studies don't give relative impacts between things. Comparison between two substances almost is never done or published in studies. People have preferences. Cost and convenience can be a factor. Key thing is avoid tossing everything at one time. If, if you toss in a whole bunch of things and it goes bad or good, it's very unclear what is helping or hurting. Do things one at a time and keep tracks. Best practice suggestions, again, this comes from dealing with MECFS, but applies to almost any conditions. Subjective evaluation is prone to false memories. False memories is a pain for it. Typically, no change. Look for objective measures. For MECFS, I use a cheap $40 smartwatch from um, China. I picked it up on Bang Goods, and it records my temperature every 10 minutes for breathing rate, temperature, pulse rate, hours of sleep, etc. You may want to record a number of tandems per day. You may want to record um, what shape of stools every time. You may want to time specific activity, like amount of time reading, time focus, how far the person walks. You want to start tracking objectively every day, getting measured, because that is your best way to see if there is an actual improvement. Um, for example, does a kid get tired from playing a game? How long does it take till he gets tired? You may actually tend to try blanking out the fact that he's playing a game, but you actually want to track how long he plays. The longer he plays, the better the cognitive improvements are. And what we are looking for is changes. Do not prejudge them as being good or bad. And I'll come to that in a moment. Um, usually add a new item every one to two weeks. Stopping prior items if you suspect an adverse reaction, otherwise keep it in. So you are going to be building um, there. And again, take it slow and gentle. You want to make good decisions based on solid objective observations. No randomness, please. And the key word is repeat and repeat. Modifiers will hopefully change by the microphone, but it, it will rarely do it direct to the target in the target way. Typically, there's a bunch of course adjustments to do. Okay, I'm going to flip over to the microbiome now to give you a quick look around. Um, and before we go down, I think we'll flip a couple of slides forward and then come back because we want to talk about something else. It is typical inexperienced mistakes. Changes often take two to four weeks to appear. Be patient. This is sometimes a hard thing to accept. Don't be surprised if you get a light to moderate Herxheimer's reaction, sometimes called die-off, often seen with, with antibiotic manipulations, may occur with some herbs too. Um, there's two um, probiotics I've taken, which when I first started them, oh boy, was I sick. Um, probiotics may do it because some, not all, produce bac bactericins, which are natural antibiotics against other species. Hey, it's a bacteria versus bacteria in your gut, bacteria fighting bacteria, and they weaponize. One of the gotcha is often commercial bacteria probiotics will pick no or low bactericins production. Why? People having a reaction to probiotics does not help sales, hence they avoid it. Other cases, the regulatory agencies it may be operating on prefers that one. And those type of ones actually tend to be relatively useless for manipulating the, the, the microbiome because you are trying to cause change. And if they just live there and don't impact anybody else, you have no impact. Come back to the key issue. Is it a Herx or an adverse reaction? That is always a hard one to do. It's very subjective. 
My rule of thumb is very simple. This reaction lasts for a few hours after dosage and then fades away, then disappears. And after the next dosage, just repeat. If it does, it's usually I would suspect it's a Herx hammer reaction. Something not to be concerned about, apart from keeping it reasonably mild. Whatever substance you are taking, try finding out the half life in the body of the substance. I would tell you, give you some idea of how long a Herx is likely to happen for. Coping strategy if something happens to become a Herx, start at a very low dosage and work up double perhaps every three days, and cut dosage to 50% if the Herx becomes unbearable or problematic. Often, I know I have taken the substance just before bedtime, cause often will cause me to sleep much harder and longer, and it can become a sleep aid. Um, basically, the bottom line issue, which I have no answer for, you could discuss with your MD, they may not have much understanding is, is the reaction caused by toxin lists by the bacteria killed by the bacterins, which is a good, or is the reaction of the body cells is direct to the substance, for example, the substance could be inducing histamine release, or is the body reacting to the toxin? Again, we don't know which way it is. There's no easy way to do, do it. Just needs to be aware that it is it something to be considered. You don't want that, Herx reaction, which means going slow, but if it does happen, it does not necessarily mean you need to back up from the substance. You need to be wise in the determination. Um, okay, so I'm going to flip back to the demo part, uh, assuming we are okay time-wise. Um, let me go in and bring in the demo site. And a quick second. I just have to get something out though. Okay, and so I'm going to bring in. The microbiome site, and I'm going to just quickly walk through what's there. Um, uploads here are for detailed uploads, the one which gives the actual percentages in the thing. We have a fair number of items there American Gut, Atlas Biome, etc. Um, we have also available. Um, videos of how to do things. Um, basically covers any lab I, I can persuade to give me data in a usable format, I will write the code to do it. We also have other lab analysis. Other lab analysis are common, for example, GI map, GI effects. Um, they are people who sell labs. They generally report on a small number of bacteria, and in general, they do not report on what percentage. They use their own reference range, which may or may not be correct, may or not may or may not be a good ranges. And they say you're high, you're low, you're very high, you're very low. So all of these ends up being ability for you to transfer the data if you have nothing else. And here's the name of the bacteria, and you just indicate what type of shift it is, and it will actually allow you to make suggestions based on the information you added in. So down the bottom, if you enter in an email, it will save the data connected to your email and send you a login link. Um, and otherwise, you just simply do the analysis. For example, uh, if I have that being extremely high, just one item. And then it goes and gives you a choice of what do you want to make use of. Um, and you could say include commercial probiotics one, how many suggestions you want on the list. The suggestions are ranked order from most 
confidence to release confidence and you kill food. and what we have up here is is showing them and what we have and in this case it's just one item um and if you or one item with high value it's a whole bunch of items with a little bit of value and you can drink a few and it will go and indicate what bacteria etc it does and gives you your study source if you're interested like for example here um Uh, it should have made how a broken patient. Yeah, but okay. Okay, so we got those two. We have Explorer. Um, and some variety of things. Probably what a lot of people use is my lookup. Look up for a microbiome mod modifier. You go in here, the percentage signs are of wild cards. Often you will not necessarily have the correct name or somebody may do it. So how it's in the database may not be exactly how you refer to it. For example, that's supposed to type the word inulin in here. And in this case, we have, oops, uh, uh, typo. There we have it and and you can just go in and click here and it gives estimates from the database we have or whether or not we'll make things better or worse just symptoms again it is assuming no nothing more than relationships there medical conditions and down the bottom bacteria notice we have a search or if we type in bifidobacteria, it will go in and um, what the impact is, whether or not we increase it or decrease it. So you get lots of information there. We can also go in and look up a particular bacteria, like for example, um, oh, let's say Lactobacillus adifidus. Again, it's, it's referred to in, in medical literature, which is um, talk about naming consistency. What lab tests reports it? Uh, uh, example, one lab test reports it 33% of the time. Bomb site reports 6% of the time. Thrive only 1.23% of the time. Again, this is determined by the software the company is using. So um, some cases they don't detect very well or they have a bad mismatch. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, symptom report that blah, 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 blah. That's, I want to just try covering the, med, the medical thing. Supplement dosages. Here we we have things listed, and if something isn't listed there, if you're interested, drop me an email and I'll track it down. Um, for example, um, somebody asked me the other day, I just added sodium azonite and click here, and we find one study used 3,000 milligrams per day, and another one uses 2,000 milligrams per day. So what doses should you be taking? Probably somewhere up in that ballpark. Same for everything. Um, if you, we go back and that's the bacteria. There we have different ones listed. And you can now say, okay, how much should my dosage share be? Uh, 1,000 million, which is 1 billion CFUs per day, and there's one study that made use of it, and it was found to be effective. Going on to more, uh, one thing, 
you could get information saturation. Believe me, you are going to get information saturation. Um, here we have something which is interesting. Usually I advocate that you only use researched probiotics, one which they give the name of the strain and there are actual studies on. Why? Because some of the things may, bacteria, strains may do nothing, no name on the bottle, no response. In fact, something like once they found that 85% of commercial probiotics do not correctly identify what is in them. They misidentify. There's no regulatory enforcement, so nobody cares. Here, in this case, all of these are specific bacteria strains which have been generally patented which means that the producer of the probiotic has a vested interest in making sure that what is declared to be in it is in fact in it and over here we have the name of what product it is in if it's known and to be honest it's just known so, um uh, let's be sinful, bacteria's cause is sinful. So if you click here, it will take you over to a site where it is. In this case, it's not available on the site. It may be available on every Amazon site or from European site. So it basically helps you find it. Often you'll be looking for a particular probiotic which you will not find your health food store like for example um this one which is is something like brewerlix but is a japanese form of it and here it is i will take you to the link here is um acromensia here is a project that contains this another project that contains the need updated here's another one which is in Yakut, all of these are proprietary strains which have been studied. And if you want to see the studies, right here, you just click here, cough, cough, cough. Um, just one is well studied, 293 separate studies, which is a painfully great amount of studies. So you can find out exactly what is being demonstrated to do, no speculation. Okay, now, I am a teacher who has a tendency to drone on and on and on, but basically go in there and explore around. Um, list people who are willing to do consults if you wish somebody to help you. Um, bacteria reported by assisting as vendors gives you a page by page comparison. I think I'm probably getting the point of time. So it goes and gives everything again. Eventually you'll see a search box showing up here um, to allow you to search the page, but it is a massive page. Okay, I think at that point of time, let's deal with questions, etc. Go off and explore the site. And one other thing, I do have a separate blog Oops. Uh, uh, which I do post on autism, I've got interesting facts or reviews of people who have given permission to use their results on there. Um, there's a big list there of autism there. And then um, goes on. So it goes on, fair amount, gives suggestions. Um, so it, it's a general thing where I post any reviews of microbiome that deals with autism. Okay, questions or whatever else. Hey, Ken, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, so great, great, uh, you know, description yes. of, of what you've done, some really great tools definitely have helped me out, helped others. I just wanted to, you know, kind of summarize and ask some questions. In particular, you know, the 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 tools that you've put together that focus on looking at actionable information from a stool test that provides you with this this raw data. 
that unequivocally has helped you to shape your biome and, and help you in your condition by using this approach, correct? Correct. Um, as a silly example, I'm almost 70, just had my year in medical. I'm on zero prescription drugs. All my lab tests came back good, and I make sure I do a microbiome test every <clears> six months and make adjustments depending on whatever is shifting. Not sure if that's a cause, but um, the whole idea is I know the microbiome diversity decreases with age and shifts starts happening with age by being aware of them and being proactive with them, even if it's not necessarily always nice having porridge with bran for breakfast every morning. It, it does do it um, to help me keep to healthier eating. So, so this, you know, and it's not specific to, to autism, although that the, the biome conditions are, are, you know, dysbiosis are definitely um, observed there, but even conditions outside like, you know, different arthritis and multiple sclerosis, there's the potential here with the tools that you've put together to take a peek to see what may be out of bounds and how to shape it. Correct. Um, particularly Things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's are definite candidates. Um, during one of my MECFS episodes, I had a spec scan. The radiologist who looked at my, my brain says, oh, it looks like you have early Alzheimer's. And early Alzheimer's. Uh, and although he said that I wasn't concerned because I knew it was caused by the microbiome dysfunction, the question is, is regular Alzheimer's caused by microbiome dysfunction and Parkinson, both of which are being investigated in clinical studies. One of the biggest problems is they are trying to still find out what the bacteria are. They have not opened that Pandora box of trying to figure out how to change the microbiome, which is what my site basically provides is the ability to say, okay, you want to change it? How do I change it? Very interesting. And, and you know, in, in your opinion, you know, the majority of practitioners, I mean, if you go to a, you know, conventional gastroenterologist, no one is, this is untapped information. It's not being used. And even if you're going to a, you know, functional medicine provider that is more knowledgeable, still not accessing the entirety of the microbiome like this, it's still, it's still not being tapped. Would you say that? Absolutely. I'll give an actual example. My wife suffers from atypical Crohn's and no medications for her. She goes in and her GI specialist sometimes scratches his head because he looks at what she's taking and he doesn't, he's American. He does not know anything about the probiotics she's taking, which is Mutaflor, which is an E. coli probiotic. It makes, has made a tremendous difference for her. Uh, anytime she starts suffering an attack, she takes some of it and it, clarif- it resolves itself within hours. Um, that, there's a tremendous amount of literature on it and it is often used in Europe and available in Europe over the counter and in Canada over the counter and in Australia over the counter, uh, as in not requiring prescription. However, it's not available in the U.S. So, um, yes, um, disseminating information, new information out to medical professional is a major challenge. Next question. Awesome. So, so yeah. So if I, if I, I want to kind of, you make sure that I'm getting your, your characterization correct stool testing like you know thrive and biome site it offers an affordable way to test and retest it doesn't give you the perfect complete answer but it gives you a good bang for the buck with actionable information and although there might be more you know informative tests out there some of that extra information may not be um, you know, uh, actionable at the moment, just because we don't have enough information to characterize how to use it. Correct. That's, that's the dilemma or what I've seen since I, I have been sending copies of dozens of different labs 
what often I've seen is when I go and read the footnotes of what you do, they will cite one study from 15 years ago saying you should take this to make this better. And they have the lab reports are not being updated in some cases for 15 years, which means, excuse me, you are not, that's not what I would like to see in a lab report. I would like to see citations from this very year if the lab was done this year, showing that they are keeping abreast of research. Uh, where would you like to see this go? Like, I mean, if you had your, your druthers in terms of, you know, additional features or, you know, what's the, what's the next step? What, what are the, what are the next kind of uh, things that, you know, and, and I, and I have to say that you're doing this all, you know, it's all pro bono. This, there's so many tools here. I can appreciate this from, from a physics background, how much work you've put into this. People don't realize the time and the hours that you've put into this site. I mean, and I really don't think, I really think a lot of the practitioners, they need to get on board because this is such untapped potential here to help other patients. And, um, you know, even if you take a snippet of that information, you, you can at least figure out what's abnormal, but where do you see it going? Okay. Uh, that's a good question. Um, my attitude is I, I view what I'm doing as a garage up, a startup. Um, basically people being being doing nicely over 2000 samples i think we've got a thousand samples uploaded in the last year and if people remember to annotate their symptoms with the samples it gives me the ability to do more unconventional data science with the data because i'm starting to understand more and more the oddity of dealing with the microbiome data um which means probably improve predictions and improve identification. Uh, even now it's good. I have had people come in and said, okay, I looked at your predictive symptom and you, you hit me dead on. And, but one of the symptoms you said I had, I didn't think I had. And then I stopped and said, I just got so accustomed to that symptom. I forgot it was a symptom. Um, <clears throat> so, the, so the predictive ability for predicting symptoms is sweet. And the aspect about predicting symptoms is that if you can predict symptoms from microbiome, you know you identify the bacteria that's causing the symptom. So now you have more confidence in addressing it. So, in, so conventionally, medicine treats a diagnosis not individual symptoms. They may do something like, oh, you have headaches, uh, acetaminophen, that type of treatment, but not really treating the symptoms root cause. So one, my hope is that it will help treat root cause of a variety of symptoms, which means you get symptom reduction, which means that if you are stuck with a condition that you can't do anything about, but your symptoms are less, you generally a happier camper. Um, the, I'm hoping and proactive with trying to get microbiome testing companies to do a better job. Um, and so far, two have been working with me to try improving the quality of information or looking at improving the quality of information. As part of it is that, yes, somebody any lab could go out and reproduce the same type of information if they're willing to invest the time and money and the amount of number of articles that have to be processed. I was smart and clever in how I process most of the data. If you did it by brute force behind PhD students, <laughs> you would never catch up to me because they would not do it in the most effective method of doing it. Um, I use lots of data science and say, okay, wait a minute, we can do this a little bit smarter and implement it. So it's the mixture of skills, being able to read a medical article and realize what the keyword is, realizing from reading it, I need to get in a database, how to get in a database, correctly code it easily. How do I know what is new and is worth spending time doing a manual review on? Um, all of those are little segments which put together, you get high efficient, um, 
processing so I can review all of the PubMed medical articles released in a month in, in not, not too many hours every once a month on weekends. So it's it makes it viable, more studies, more cooperation. One of the things we have done is to try to make it persuadable to medical professionals by having a totally open data so that, oh, he suggests this. I had no idea about that. Oh, here's the link to the study where it comes from. Oh, oh, he's right. I haven't read that study. Most professionals don't have time to keep current. And if they start using the site and start double checking the articles, they will start saying, wait a minute, this saves, my, saves me time and current and I don't have to read all the articles. I can, to some degree, trust his encoding of the data, and I can use that encoding of the data to help my patients or myself. Well, I think that's amazing. I, I can't thank you enough. And uh, you know, I just want to reiterate, you know, to to do one of these Thrive or Biome site tests, you know, you don't need a a prescription to go out and this is, you know, to get these tests. Obviously. You, you would want to work with a knowledgeable practitioner, but many of the suggestions and analyzing the, the biome data, um, they could be, you know, these are non necessarily prescriptive agents. It could be, you know, walnuts or cinnamon or a prebiotic or a probiotic that is easily or, or accessible. One of my two favorite items. One is triphala, which is an Indian herb or mixture. Um, and the other one is a what's called a neutrophic paracetium, which is there are a bunch of studies on PubMed about paracetium autism. Um, it basically helps oxygen delivery to the brain, which means that for people with autism who have some sort of coagulation issue concurrent with it or caused by the microbiome, it basically helps the brain function better. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, you know, more. This is just a wealth of information that people can dive into. It's, it's like you said, it could be a little overwhelming in the beginning, but once you use it a couple of times, you put so many videos up there. Um, you know, you can get a a good idea of the potential dysbiosis that you may have and some some mm -hmm. directions that you want to go. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm so happy for all the work that you've put together in this. My usual suggestion, which is actually attempting to evangelize it, is you get your suggestions from my site, and you walk into your MD, and you ask them to review it. Some may just say, oh, fine, no problem, because there's no prescription drugs on it, so they do nothing. Others may say, okay, may become curious. And the ones who become curious would like to go to the site and start exploring it, and hopefully would be, I hate to use the word, converts. Yeah, I agree. I think we need to spread the word and, and get, get everybody on board. And um, I, I think there's a lot of potential here to help in, in autism, outside of autism, and just, uh, you know, expanding these ideas, getting people to to bring their their analysis to the tables. And, and um, you know, I, I think what's made, and you might agree, what made this possible was kind of the, the uh, the technology of, of you know sequencing the, the the stool almost like what we do with the the DNA uh, how it became affordable and you know prior to this we were kind of really you know uh, shooting in the dark. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, so it's interesting. What I so far have found is my creativity and being operations research oriented for background, which means. We don't necessarily care about what the right answer is. We are looking for good answers. Uh, has caused me to keep exploring into the microbiome and trying to do mathematical magic, like for example, determining what a abnormal value is from the data itself, which is a novel approach. Or what I recently did, which was um, finding out which bacteria impacts other bacteria through rather novel method, which um, allowed me to say, okay, ah, now I, I know what influences bacteria A from bacteria B, which now allows me to give more suggestions because 
I can now say, okay, if A is wanting to be increased, and we know B, C, and D, if they increase, increases A, what increases B, C, and D? And I now get additional suggestions to come in that way. Um, I just recently did a YouTube on it. So it's basically struggling, saying, okay, we have so much data. We need to be more efficient in using it. We need to tease more data out of it. And if we tease more data out of it, it will benefit more people. Just just got a curiosity. How I mean, are you aware of how many practitioners may be using this um, in some way or, or at least keeping keeping abreast of it? I, I would say roughly a dozen or at least dozen who have had indications of it. And <laughs> comical. Um, I my site did get mentioned once in a published journal just last couple of months ago, uh, which was sort of interesting to see that I actually cited a professional journal, which was sort of amusing. Wow, so we're just getting out this only. Yeah. And and if you had some advice to a to a startup, you know, yeah. uh, microbiome uh, testing company, I guess, you know, one of the things that I say is, is that, you know, give us the raw data, right? I mean, uh, that's that's something that we need to... Uh, I mean, if you do a DNA test and the company won't allow you to download your DNA, uh, your life expectancy selling DNA is just about zero because everybody else allows it. Um, you buy on the original main supplier was sweet. They made FastQ available. They made everything available. But then when they went out of business, a lot of start the other went close what i call closed shop closed black box um often because they really don't want a second opinion because the business model is so often selling other products so if they keep a closed book and they say we've looked at, at your thing and what you really need is our probiotic which are quote custom developed for you they have a viable business model, especially since probiotics have a very high markup, a very high profit margin to them. So um, basically, the main thing is figure out what, what you're doing. Is your job going to just produce the data and some preliminary reports, or are you trying to provide the data and context to it to a greater extent? It's what we're seeing with the DNA testing applies to microbiome testing, except there's a lot of people out there who are selling simple solutions and citing. We do we do RNA testing, but they don't give you data. And they don't give you relative data. And it's often becomes a matter of trust us. We know what we are doing. And I go snicker, snicker, snicker. I really don't think you do. Yeah, I can't. I can't agree more. Um, this has been really great. You know, I I, uh, I really appreciate everything that you've done for the community, and I encourage people to go check out microbiome microbiomeprescription dot com. Uh, donate if you're able to. Uh, Ken has put so many hours together, so many resources. Um, you know, I, I think it's really untapped. It, it that, that you know, it's very. It's not difficult at all. And then some of this testing is, is low hanging fruit, very inexpensive, relatively speaking. Um, so I really encourage everyone to, to check out every piece of information he's compiled on the microbiome, how you can help yourself. And, um, you know, I, I, I look forward to, you know, having you uh, talk more about your site and as the, as the, you continue to update it, I, I know there's going to be new things on the horizon. Thank you. Awesome. Any questions from anybody else, or shall we let him get back to his kids? <laughs> uh, I don't see anything coming over the wire. Um, I think that's probably it. Uh, are you open to collaborating with with other, uh, you know, other practitioners and other researchers in, you know, uh, with your in your site? Absolutely. I've just added a um, page for researchers where they can get data processed through my variety of databases easily. 
and get the results back. Um, download uh, CSV files so that they can load it into Excel or R or PHP or whatever they want to do to make use of it. So that's really awesome. Now, um, there's an API available for uh, any commercial businesses who wants to make use of the data. Um, the API basically works on a cost because they're making profit from it. Then the API is okay. You could have to pay me a few cents for every API call you made since you're making profit from it, you can afford to pay for it. Whereas the general public, some people simply don't have the economics to um, do anything. Hence it's free rather than denying people. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Ken. I, I think that's, I think that's, uh, you know, all our questions and I'm sure we'll have some in the future and we'll be able to have you on again, but thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And uh, definitely check out microbiomeprescription.com. So many resources there. And uh, this was a really great interview. Thank you again. My pleasure. Take care.